Hello and welcome to DEI Advisors. My name is Lan Elliott on behalf of DEI Advisors. And today's guest advisor is Allison Reed. And I'm really lucky to have had the opportunity to work with her a couple times over the course of my career. And I'm looking forward to her sharing her incredible journey with you. Allison is the Chief Global Growth Officer at Ambridge Hospitality. So welcome, Allison. Thanks, Land. I think I'm the lucky one that's got to work with you several, several times in our career. So you started um, your career actually on the finance side of the of the uh, industry, um, and you now lead a global team focusing on growing Ambridge's footprint. Can you share with us some of the inflection points in your career and maybe some of the factors or or maybe your key attributes um, that have contributed to your success? Um, sure. I mean, as anyone knows, when you have a long career, there's a lot of inflection points. So I'll, I'll point to three that I think were the biggest. Um, one, um, my first job out of undergrad was in banking. And um, you know, I knew it, I was real. I had a finance background. I had a hospitality background and an accounting. I had like three majors. I mean, um, so I went into banking, and I quickly knew it probably wasn't for me. It was a time, you know, the late '80s, where it was a really interesting place to be, especially if you're a woman. So I made a quick, you know, I was there maybe a year, and I I moved to hospitality to the St. Regis in New York. So that's the first inflection point. I knew it wasn't for me. It just didn't feel right. It didn't feel like the right environment for me. And so I made a change, even though at the time to go from banking to hotels, especially so young, maybe wasn't the best. P people didn't think it was the best idea, but I thought it was the best idea for me. Um, the second was then I was at ITT Sheraton for a while and I made a decision to go to interstate third party management. Again, not really, I'd been at that's uh, shared tonight, I think five or six years. Uh, unusual move, right? Most people were were wanting to be at the brands at that point. Um, but for me, I went, and this is a theme throughout my career, because of the people that were at Interstate at the time. So, and then the third part, probably big inflection was at the end of Starwood. Um, uh, when, um, you know, Marriott Starwood acquisition, that was an inflection point was like, what do I really want to do with my life? Not, you know, what's the what's the next thing I want to do in my career? Like, where do I want to spend my time? Um, so those are the three biggest. And I think the takeaway is like, and at the time, I don't think I knew myself. I just had a feeling this would be better to go from here to there. The last inflection point was you kind of, you know, after so many years, you kind of know um, or at least I took the time after Starwood to figure out what I wanted to do. That's great. And um, one of the things that you are particularly good at is building teams. I know it's one of the things you really enjoy doing. Can you yeah. share how you approach doing this when you join a new organization? What, what are the things that you do first? How, how do you decide to build a team? Yeah, so I got to, you know, building teams. I, I like process. I don't like bureaucracy, but I do like process. I like to understand how things work, how you can get things to go from good to great or from bad to good. Um, and building a team is the same thing as any process, right? So, so when I, and I kind of stumbled into this team building, you know, enjoying it, being good at it. I stumbled into it because like most things in my career, someone said, Hey, do you want to do this? And I said, sure, let's try it. You know what I mean? Like I just said, okay, let's try it. Um, so one is the first thing I do, and I just did this. I mean, I'm literally at Ambridge four months, so I'm right in the thick of this part of it. The first thing is the first day when you meet people or you have meetings with your direct uh, reports is, um, and I've always had teams that I've gone in, had a team existing and then had to, you know, work with that team, rearrange that team, add to that team. So this isn't building from scratch. This is existing. Is I just talked to each of them. Uh, this time I came up with what are the four questions? What are you good at? What are, what are you What are you not that great at? What do you like to do? And what don't you like to do? Or what? what's the worst thing you would uh, have? To, if you had to do something 
um, uh, and you didn't want to do it, what would that be? So I figured if you're good at something and you like doing it, great, you're going to do a great job. If you're good at something and it's not, it doesn't thrill you, but you're good at it, you, you do a good job because you just want to get in, get it done. Organizational planning is that for me. I don't love it, but I think I'm good at it so I can get in and get it done. There are certain things that I don't like doing. And so, you know, I don't love um, conference panels. I don't love doing interviews like this, but I obviously would do it for you. So I tend to not do them as much um, because there's other people that can do them better than me. So that's when I'm building a team. If I ask you those four questions, I know kind of who you are and what you would be good at. Then I, you know, or simultaneously or, um, you know, within a couple of weeks, what was I hired to do? What, what am I supposed to do? What's what um, has the company hired me to do? And how do I get from where we are today to where we need to go? So once I know that, then I lay out the strategic plan, right? At Ambridge Global Growth Officer, obviously I'm focused on growth, right? So then I try to figure out, okay, what's the map? What's the process of how we, you know, I look at our industry, I look at a bunch of different things, I come up with the process map or the strategy. Then it's like fielding a baseball team. You know, Lan is good at this, Tom is good at this, but Lan doesn't like to do this. So let's just let her do this for a short period of time, but not be her entire career, right? So then you're just like, you know, who, who wants to play first base, but who's good at first base, things like that. Then it just gets easier to build the team. And I'm really obsessed for the last 10 years with strength finders or predictive indexes. Those are just little tasks that you can give your team when you ask somebody what you want to do, they'll tell you what they want to do. They don't usually tell you what they're good at or what they don't like to do or what they're bad at. And they usually say like, I want to build my career. I want to advance. I want to get to the next position. That doesn't really help me build a team. You know what I mean? I've played third base. I'm really good at it, but you know, I got hit in the face and now I'm scared to do it. Okay. Well don't put them on third base. So, you know, things like that is kind of, I think what helps you build a team or at least that's how, how I've, how I've done it in the past. Um, and I think people are happier. And so if people are happier and more productive on the team, you, you make tweaks along the way, people change, people move, people get promoted, people's interest changes, but, but that team structure still stays in place. So it's pretty easy to keep it going for a while and not have to, you know, the dreaded reorg. I don't really like that word or having to do that often. So I try to, again, the analogy of a sports team, players come and go, but if the if you look at it and you built it the right way, you can usually add and, and subtract pretty easily. I, I think it's so interesting. You talked about reorgs and, and we've been through a few of them together um, yeah. <laughs> in our former lives. Uh, yeah. But, you know- if you work I long enough, I'll you'll be through them. Right? That's true. Enough, That's true. It's, it's one of the things you need to learn to deal with. But exactly. a lot of leaders will start with this boxology. This is the job. These are the job descriptions. And the, this is who do I put in these seats? What I think is really interesting about your approach is you start with the people and you find out what they like to do, what they don't like to do, what they're good at. And then you craft the team that way. It's actually yeah. coming at it from the opposite direction, which I find really interesting. Um, yeah, and you've known me long enough. I, I don't like job description. I don't like putting things in a box or just looking at things like, well, we've always done it this way. I mean, I've been working for 30 years. I think I've read or created two job descriptions my entire career. You know, what is the job we're trying to get done? Okay, well, two people can do it very different ways. So there are some baseline skill sets. Do you have the skill? Uh, do you have the technical skill? Are you the right personality? Very different if you are a deal person or a feasibility person. Same person can do both jobs, but the jobs are different, right? So, so, um, and again, I've been in the same industry for 30 years, 30 plus years. So it's not a lot of difference in the jobs. It's just a different approach and people do it differently. I, I mean, development, there are very different approaches, sales versus banker types you know, yeah. introvert, extrovert, they all work. If you if you do what's natural to you, you'll be successful. If you try to do it 
because that's the way land does it. So I'll do it that way. But you're not like you personality wise. You won't. It won't work. You won't be successful. So. Absolutely. And, and I've definitely, uh, you know, tried to mirror my boss's approach to things and it wasn't authentic to me and it didn't work. Um, exactly. And so but that's yeah. a big problem for women uh, in male dominated fields. I feel again, I shouldn't say this is a gross generalization, but my experience has been uh, and it's hard when you're the minority not to try to emulate the person in charge. But but it just doesn't work. It doesn't come off right. Uh, something seems off. It's like when the TV is off kilter a little bit, the movie is not as enjoyable. So um, anyway, that's that's what I've seen and I've experienced myself. And we've all tried it. We've all tried on other people's personalities. Um, and it usually ends badly. Let's move over to um, a, a topic um, around overcoming self-doubt. So a lot of times our biggest critics are ourselves and that noise in your head can make you doubt yourself or your skills. What strategies do you use to stay positive, to un overcome that internal narrative? Um, well, we all have it. I mean, everyone has it. If someone tells you they don't, please give them my phone number. I'd like to, I'd like to talk to them about how they've done it. But, um, you know, the, the older I've gotten, just the less time I focus on it. I mean, I had it today to get on this call with you, right? It's like, why is she interviewing me? There's probably somebody better. Should I be doing this? And it's like, listen, Land knows what she's doing. Get on the call, uh, you know, explain to people, uh, DEI advisors are doing great things. So get over yourself and move on and you'll be fine. And if not, what's the worst thing that could happen? It's great advice. Sometimes we just need to push through um, exactly. and, and know that you're, that because you were asked that, that you're here for a reason. So, right. Yeah, that's a good point. And, um, you know, the strategy to me is like lately has been what's the worst that's going to happen. Uh, advice for other people is that um, someone can always learn something from you. No matter who you are, someone can always learn something from you. So if you're asked to do something, show up. And even if you're not perfect or you say something wrong, it's fine. Someone's going to learn something from you. I love that advice. So similar uh, along the same along the same lines is uh, a generalization that is out there is that women are not really great at advoca advocating for themselves. Um, and that's part of the challenge in seeing women elevated to the C-suite, getting promotions, raises they they would like to have. What would you tell people who are struggling to find their voice? Yeah, I mean, this is a tough one because this goes back to being authentic because I feel sometimes when you give people advice, what works for me doesn't necessarily work for someone else. And I've I've seen younger women that work for me try to try to use my style and I cringe a little bit because I was like that's not going to work for you it's just not their personalities or it's not the right moment um I think advocating so for me in my career the best way to advocate for myself has always been to be prepared work really hard and surround yourself with the right people because then I'm not I'm not I might have some bosses that will beg to differ here, especially in the last couple of years, but typically I wasn't great at advocating for myself. Um, you know, as some others I had seen really advocate for themselves. But I've also been very, very lucky to have bosses and peers that advocated on my behalf. And uh, a lot of that I think had to do because I, I, I showed up on time. I worked hard. I always tried to have the answer, even may I, you know, I obviously didn't always have the answer. But if you're prepared, you work hard, you kind of stay at us some of the stuff that happens in corporations and drama and gossip and things, stay away from that. Uh, then you tend to not make any enemies. And if you're working hard, your team player, you're not making any enemies. Others will advocate for you. So you don't you don't have to. Right. They'll advocate for you. Um, but if you're in a situation where you feel and I've had this happen to me 
where you feel that's just not fair. That's just not fair. Uh, uh, it's never really happened to me promotion wise. I never felt like someone got something that I deserved. Um, but it certainly has happened in raises and bonuses. And sometimes I let it go. And other times I pick the right time to go talk to my boss and say, look, um, these are the facts. I try to use facts, not opinion, you know, like, uh, you know, so and said, so and so told me they got this. That's bad, you know. Um, but sometimes you know, you know what people get. I was in finance, I was, you know, ran, um, I was a chief of staff. I knew what people got paid, I knew what bonuses were paid. In those situations, I just went, I didn't go after the other person, I didn't compare myself to the other person. I would just say, this is the facts of what I've gotten done, and this is what I think is fair. So, you know, once you start comparing yourself, you don't know. You don't know everything that the other person did or you weren't there all the time. So I try to, like, not compare myself. I'll say, this is what I did and this is what I think is a fair, you know, compensation or bonus or or opportunity. Um, because I think if you start comparing to others, A, you don't know, and B, now you're putting the person that made those decisions on the defensive. And you don't want the person deciding your bonus on the defensive, right? You want them to be an advocate for you saying, hey, you know, I didn't consider that fact. You know, we, Lana, as you know, you and I come up through the negotiation side a lot. This is like a classic negotiation uh, concept, right? Be prepared, pick your moves, don't put the other side on the defensive. You know, these are like classic negotiation skills. So I guess I would say, one key thing advocating for yourself read a lot of negotiation books because it is a negotiation advocation isn't negotiation yes I, I think that's really uh very pointed advice to pick your moment be prepared stick to the facts um and and i and i love the advice to stay away from comparison because it's such an easy thing to slip into um, and you're right, you don't know all the circumstances and that's the first thing they could probably say to you. Um, and you're gonna put them on the defensive. So I think, um, you know, staying away from that is, is really wonderful advice. So. Yeah, and, and you know, for me in my career, I, I think one time in my entire career, I had to have that conversation because I had a lot of advocates, a lot of them, which is why I was able to move and, and, and I think they were advocates because I, I worked for them. I worked hard. I got things done. But um, um, and I like the word advocates better than mentors. Like a mentor tells you how to do things. An advocate recognizes what you're doing and and, you know, speaks on your behalf to point out things. So. Definitely. Yes. That that difference between mentors who kind of give you guidance and give you advice and then a different uh, relationship when you have a champion or an advocate, they're really someone who speaks up for you when you're not in the room, who's going Correct. to say, how Correct. about Allison for this? Or she's yeah. been doing great at this. We should consider her. Um, that's really, you know, when you can earn yourself a champion or an advocate, that really can make a big difference. Um, let's, let's talk about that. Yeah. Like who, yes. um, can, well, can, I, you I mean, me? can I tell you, I've had so many of them. I've had so many of them. It's like embarrassing. So, uh, um, Fred Kleisner early in my career, Ted Darnell, Denise Cole, Simon Turner, Mike Dietemeyer, Mike, Mike DeFrino, now Mike Dietemeyer. Um, God, just, just multiple. I mean, you know, you're on the development side, you have advocates, the owners or the, the guys you're negotiating against become your advocate, right? They, they say like, look, they did a really good job in a negotiation. I did, you know, you got a fair deal. Um, my team, people that have worked for me and with me have become advocates, peers, right? That's when you don't get into the, and, and I've we've worked in big companies where there's typically a lot of comparison, uh, uh, jealousy, drama, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, if you just stay out of that, there's no sense to be in it. It doesn't help you. It makes you feel bad. So if you stay out of it, uh, you know, promotion committees come, it's not just your boss, it's your boss's peers. Um, and this is very different than managing up. I'm not a fan of managing up and everyone kind of knows what that means, 
But um, if you work hard and do a good job, your boss's peers tend to see the impact it has on your boss, their peers. And so then they become champions for you, but then they also try to get you to come work on their team. So now you got a little bidding war going a little bit, you know what I mean? So um, it, it really, I think it really um, helps. And, and, and those that have worked with me, I would say, I don't think people would say, oh, she's really nice. I don't think that's the first word that comes out of their mouth, but I hope it's that, no, she's fair. She's fair. You know, she's opinionated. She has her point of view, but she's fair. I, I prefer, I like the word fair better than nice. So let's talk about nice because <laughs> yeah. one of the things, one of the tight ropes that I think women, women walk this, this assertiveness double bind is this idea that you need to be either nice or competent. You can't yeah. really be both. If you're too nice, you're soft. You're not going to be a good uh, leader. You're not going to be able to do the job. Um, and vice versa. And if and if you're a little bit too uh, direct or um, ambitious, you know these these are kinds of words assertive. These are words that often are not well received. Coming, you know, behaviors not re well received coming from a woman. And we've both been on the real estate and deal side of the industry. <laughs> not a lot of women. How how do you um, think about? Um, you know, having challenging conversations because you've had to have a number of them. How do you find the right balance to do this? Um, so I would just want to one minute, give a shout out to the women that are nice and competent. Carla Murray, Denise Cole, Tiffany Cooper. I mean, there's probably Charlotte DeHaven. There's probably a, a, a lot, like Lan Elliott. There's a lot of them out there. Um, uh, in the deal side or the finance side or the side we've been on, right, very male dominated, very at times negotiation is a strength game. Um, so I think, again, it's, I sound like a broken record, but uh, you're in a heated negotiation. Uh, you know, sometimes there's private equity guys, sometimes there's bankers. These are these are very strong individuals that know lawyers. I mean, they know their game. They know how to play it very well. So one, uh, be respectful. You, as a woman, you always have to be respectful. I really believe that's true, even more so. I, I shouldn't say woman if you're a minority, because you are a minority in the room. Um, but if you know your stuff, if you pick the time to, to, to say something, early in my career, I had to listen a lot. You, I was the only woman in the room. And a lot of times I was the youngest person in the room. So you have to listen. You get really good at reading people's moods or expressions or, or modes. So there, there are real benefits of being the minority in the room because you know when someone's ready to hear what you have to say. Uh, the other strategy I've learned several years ago, and I use it all the time in negotiations, don't explain yourself sometimes. You know, if someone says, why can't you do this? You just say, I'm not going to do that or no. And no is a complete sentence in a negotiation, right? Like when you start explaining, then 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 people want to uh, um, debate your explanation. And that, again, for women, uh, because people either get louder. When you've said the same thing over and over again, you tend to get louder in your voice. Louder for women is different than for men or minorities. So so there's just tricks along the way that I've learned to um, know how to, for me, authentic for me. And other times I'm like a bull in a china shop, you know what I mean? But I tend to do that with people I've known a really long time. Um, I can be very assertive Again, a lot of the people I mentioned will tell you she's very assertive, but but I don't think I it doesn't come from a fear or, or I don't think people feel fearful when I'm assertive. There'll probably be a lot of people objecting to that. But, you know, um, I, and I, I also the other thing is I really, really, really try hard not to make it personal or take it personal because uh, 
I get fearful when someone's assertive and I feel like it's personal, like they're coming after me or they're enraged about something. Then I, then it, it's like, well, this is going to go off the track fast because um, somebody's afraid or somebody's mad. And so that I think is tough. So again, a lot of times you got to try these things out, right? You got to do what's right for you. The other thing is reading people's bodies language or having somebody afterwards say, wow, that seemed a little weird. How'd that go? Like, I think you can learn a lot from people's body language and um, sometimes just from what they say to you and ask people, was that too much? Was that not enough? You know, I think that's, I think that's perfectly fine. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, what you said about early in your career as a woman, you spent a lot of time listening um, and reading the room. Um, and I think that's something that women actually do really well, um, because sometimes, especially early in your career, you're more observing. You don't really get to do the talking, um, but then it yeah. serves you better later because then you have a sense of, OK, reading the body language, reading what they're saying. Um, and the unspoken pieces of it um, become a bit more intuitive, which really helps direct your negotiations. A hundred percent. I have a great one second story on that. Early in my career, myself and another woman were the only women in a room of, I don't know, 30 men. And the subject was hair dryers. And that, that discussion, hair dryers in the room and whatever, that discussion went on for 20 minutes. At no point did anyone ask the opinion of the two women in the room that had long hair and actually had facts on hair dryers, not one. And several, several of the men in the room were bald. So at some point, the other woman, not me, spoke up and everyone was like, oh my God, that totally makes sense. What? So no one was being condescending or anything else. It just sometimes doesn't occur to think does somebody else have information that I don't have? So that that happened oh, so long ago. But I think of that almost almost every time I'm in a meeting, that story comes to mind to say, stop. If we're talking about something for 20 minutes, we don't have the answer, clearly. So look around who's not talking, who, you know, maybe you pull something out of someone, especially someone that's not talking. I, I kind of play this little game with myself. I'm like, I know they have the answer. Let me just ask them. They probably have the yeah. answer. And a lot of times they do. A lot of times the quiet ones have the answer. That's really that's really a great thing to think about that maybe the quiet ones do have the answer. I think I'm going to steal yeah. that one. Yeah. All the introverts will love that. That's right. That's right. So one of the things I wanted to touch on, you, you had mentioned uh, often being one of the only or one of the few women in the room, especially in negotiations. Um, but we actually had a deal that we worked on together a number of years ago where almost every single person in the transaction, actually almost every single leader in the transaction was a woman, um, including the attorneys. Um, and I've only had one such experience in my 30 plus years of, of, of doing this. And it was really refreshing. Can you share a few thoughts on the dynamics around that deal as a result? Because we've never really talked about, you know, yeah. the dynamics of that because we were on different parts of the transaction. Correct. So this was a transaction. I was at Kimpton, Land was at IHG, and we were doing a transaction with Heather Turner, who was the female developer. At, uh, Tavis, Tamarack, Tamarack. So, and the lawyers were female, um, uh, Charlotte on Kim, to, there was all female. I think, I think maybe two people were men um, on the transaction. I think the best thing I, I could say about it is it didn't dawn on any of us until way after the transaction was done that it was mostly women on the transaction. That is kind of what stunned me the most about that transaction, right? So so at no point did we say, wow, it's almost all women on this transaction until I think months later after the transaction was done and we were reflecting on it that we were like, wow, that transaction was all women. That's so that I think that's that's where we want to get to be, right? We wanna we wanna make sure that that rooms are diverse and there's the diverse thought. Um, 
the one in reflecting the one difference is um, there wasn't there wasn't as much assertiveness on the call, um, but there was definitely a negotiation. I mean, this was not like we all got in a room and agreed on everything, right? There was very strong right. points of negotiations and differences and back and forth and um, a lot of the same feelings that happened during a negotiation, good and bad, came up, um, which I think is great that there really wasn't that, that much difference between a transaction where there's mostly men. Um, I think we all behave the exact same way. At least I did. Oh, what do you think? Do you think? Um, yeah, I, I think it was something that we looked back and we said, wow, you know, that that was all women. Um, I think there was, honestly, I think there was maybe a little bit less posturing. Um, I, I think there was much yeah. more open discussion of what's fair, what do we need. Um, maybe there was a little bit less posturing than what we might have said. I agree. And if I think now there probably was a lot more uh, efficiency and just like, because we were all busy, have different things going on, right? There was a lot more like, let's get on, let's get through this. Yeah. Um, because we were all trying to find our a, a solution that worked for everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think we moved more efficiently, maybe. But I love all the guys I negotiate with, too. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of great guys on the deal side. So, yeah. yes, definitely. Yeah. So one of our favorite questions on DEI advisors is what advice would you give to your younger self? Uh, gosh. Um, one is uh, go for it even more. I mean, I, I, I did a lot of different things in my career. I took any assignment anyone gave me. So I, I definitely wasn't cautious, um, but I would say, you'll figure it out. I mean, I, I did that a lot in my career. It's like, why does he want me to take this job? Okay, I'll figure it out. Um, but I would do that even more, I think. Uh, two, I would not, I would very quickly get to the question about, you know, when you have negative thought in your head. Uh, I think I dwelt on it more when I was younger. I would definitely uh, give myself that advice. Like, listen, don't, you know, people say you don't don't have negative thought. That's not possible. You're going to have it. So my advice for myself now and for my younger self is just move through it quickly. Just acknowledge it and move past it quickly. Um, and then maybe slow down a little bit and enjoy things a little bit. I mean, um, sometimes in our younger selves, I remember I, I flew to Japan for a meeting, came back in 24 hours. That wasn't smart. I should have stayed and enjoyed it a little bit, you know, but I thought I had to get back to the office or, you know, there were several trips to Asia that was very quick. So maybe, maybe, um, you know, smell the roses a little bit more. That's great advice. Hard to do when you, when you're working hard and, and, and working your way up, but it is, it is yeah. really good advice. Yeah. Maybe not too much, maybe not too much, but maybe a little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Allison, you and I have had a lot of long conversations and I could talk to you for a really long time because we've done that many times. Um, but yes. we are getting close to the end of our time. And so I wanted to ask you, uh, knowing that the uh, mission of DEI Advisors is around empowering personal success, what final bit of advice would you offer to women and under underrepresented groups who are looking to advance their careers? Well, one is know, just know you belong. Know that you belong. Know that you have a right to have a seat at the table. Uh, try to stay away from uh, this this industry that tells us nobody wants you there. Nobody nobody sees you there. You know what I mean? Like again, obviously we've all felt that at times and sometimes there are people, but I don't think it's the majority of the people, at least I don't see that. So in your self-confidence, we talked a lot about self-confidence. If you're prepared, if you've done the work, if you show up on time, if you work hard, it doesn't, you belong there. I mean, period, end stop. You belong there if you've done all those things and others will see that. I'm really, really confident that others will see that. Maybe not as quickly as, you know, if they're all this, 
if there's all, I'll, I'll look this way. If there's all women in the room and a, and a man walks in, they're going to feel the same thing. So it's not just women and, and minorities. It's if you are in the minority in that room and you've done all of those things, you belong there. So the advice was be confident and be yourself. And I, 99.9% .9 of the times, others will see that. And if they don't, maybe you're in the wrong room. Maybe you're in the wrong industry. Maybe you're working for the wrong company or the wrong boss. Um, that, that could be the case. But then go find your people, find your place um, where people respect who you are and you'll be fine. Fabulous advice. Thank you so much, Allison. It's been wonderful speaking with you. Yes, and thank you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So thrilled to have you on. And for our viewers, if you've enjoyed this interview, we hope you'll join us on our website, deiadvisors.org, where you can find interviews with other senior leaders in the hospitality industry. So thank you, Allison, so much. Thank you. Bye.